Welcome to Life Transformation Radio. This show is all about life transformations and our journey from where we were to why we are doing what we are doing today. We will discuss the hiccups, the roller coasters, and the blood, sweat, and tears that has been poured out while discovering our purpose. It is all about our transformation. Here is your host, Sean Douglas. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening from wherever you're listening from. This is Life Transformation Radio with your host, Master Resilience Implementer, TEDx Speaker, Business Positioning Strategist, and International Best-Selling Author, Sean Douglas. This show is currently heard in over 79 countries, so whether it's your first time joining us or you've been listening to us for some time, I want to thank you to those who are listening from around the world. Life Transformation Radio is all about our transformation. Here, we tell the stories of why we're doing what we're doing. We highlight that transformational moment that changed our lives and how we use it to then transform others and elevate their lives as well. You can listen to us live right here on the Blog Talk Radio Network at 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time during the week. You can join our Facebook group, Live Transformation Radio Community, and never miss an episode by subscribing wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. Live Transformation Radio can be heard on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spreaker, Spotify, TuneIn, Player FM, Radio Public, Overcast, CastBox, Himalaya app, Google Play Music app, Pandora, and we are available on YouTube. Join us live, 5.30 p.m. Eastern Time, and subscribe, rate, and review wherever it is that you listen to podcasts. On the show, my guests are entrepreneurs, speakers, business owners, coaches, other podcasters, authors, basically amazing human beings that are impacting the world around them. And my guest today has done exactly that, has influenced the entire world, literally. If you have any questions for any of the guests that are bringing on the show during our live broadcast, call us up at 657-383-1109. Again, the number is 657-383-1109. And with that, please tell me welcome to the show. My guest for today, Ron Klein. Ron, welcome to Life Transformation Radio. Well, thank you, Sean. Thank you so much for having me, and I'm really looking forward to this. I've been on the radio quite a, a number of times. I've had many, many interviews, but I'm really I'm excited to be in 79 countries, and I only have to speak one <laughs> language. So that's great. That's Terrific. awesome. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I saw you. We were talking before. I, you know, I saw you at PodFest last year in Orlando and was blown away at what you have accomplished in your life. And I am completely honored as a fan, as a podcaster, and as an entrepreneur myself, the creator of four businesses, successful businesses, that I can spend time with a guy who has literally just invented and, and has had many innovative ideas that the world has adopted and they don't even know it. But you know what, Sean? I'm really basically a very simple guy, and and I can get away with anything I say now because, um, and you ready? I'm coming up on 85, but I'm not empty yet. Wow. Okay. But <laughs> at, at 85, great. I can really tell my story, and my whole existence and my whole thought process has been simplicity. I never looked at anything as a problem, and, and in my lifetime, I consider Problems don't even exist. They're nothing but frustrations. I look at everything as a challenge. And I feel that mm. there's a gift. There's a gift behind every challenge. And there's an opportunity behind every challenge. And all you have to do in how to handle the challenge is to establish what's the given in your challenge. You know, what do you have to work with? And where do you want to end up? And everything else in between is just the journey and it's the minutia. And there's lots of hurdles along the way in that minutia, but you never want to lose sight as you simplify. What are you working with? What's the given? And where do you want to go with this? And that's it. And by simplifying it, you, you, you have the answer. And, and I look at that in a way where the principle, my principal thought is basically to be successful in whatever you do, 
in your personal life, in your business life, or whatever you choose to do. You've got to be smart, daring, and different. And that's what I want your audience to take away. And when I say smart, I don't necessarily mean a, a, a PhD from an Ivy League school. I mean, pay attention. Learn something new every day. Talk to people. Everybody's got something to offer. Everybody has knowledge. No matter what level they are at life, you can always learn something new and be aware. So that's what I mean by being smart. And then to be daring, I say don't be afraid to make mistakes. You know, you learn by your mistakes, and you never want to make Mm -hmm. the same mistake twice. But uh, if you painted something the wrong color the first time, what do you do? You painted a different color. So that's how you paint. <laughs> yeah. It's simple. And then the last thing is to be different. And when I say different, yeah. this is the most important issue. You never want to do anything that is not a benefit. It must provide a benefit. If it doesn't provide a benefit, it's nothing more than a hobby. So I say you have to be smart, daring, and different, and different provides benefits. And that's my, and I lived my whole life by that. And that's how I came up with new innovations. You know, I never, oh, that was a nice chime. Is that telling me something, Sean? What's that? Is that a warning? Is that a warning? I heard a chime. Nope. Am I just hearing it? Oh, okay. (laughs) And, (laughs) okay. And, And when I say to be different, you really have to, Look at everything as a benefit. Don't even start a project unless you can do something that's going to be rewarding and something that benefits you, benefits society, benefits the cause. Because, uh, you know, they, people claim that I'm an inventor. I'm not an inventor. I'm really a, a problem solver and an innovator. If somebody comes to me with a challenge, I look at the challenge and I identify it and I say, okay, I'm not going to sit in the think tank all day and hold my head and say, what can I invent today? I'm going to say, how can I make this better? And what can I do to help provide a benefit? And that, that was everything that I did along the way, all of my so-called inventions. Um, and I guess the best, the simplest thing I've ever done in all of my career was the magnetic strip on the credit card. Do you think your audience Mm -hmm. would like to hear that story real quick? Okay. Yeah. What I I want to – quickly what I want to do is I want to go right through real quick uh, and and read the the bio, give them some links so they can really dive in after the show. And uh, and, and let's do that real quick. The title of this episode is is The Grandfather of Possibilities, Ron Klein. He is an ordinary man who accomplishes extraordinary things. He is a problem solver, strategic advisor, consultant, mentor, and speaker. Ron is known as the the, the grandfather of possibilities. Every solution has resulted in monumental change, either in a new invention or a simple solution. His innovative ideas have changed the world. He is the inventor of the magnetic strip on the credit card credit card validity checking system, and the developer of computerized systems for real estate, which is MLS, Multiple Listing Services, the voice response for the banking industry, and bond quotation and trade information for the New York Stock Exchange. Ron's latest patent is for a device that enables a visually impaired person the ability to identify an item when in physical range of that item. It utilizes a smartphone and special coded adhesive labels. You can visit Envision, Eli, E-L-I, Envision, Envision, Eli, dot com for additional information on how he has enhanced Eli technology to provide unlimited marketing functions and benefits for all industries. The website is the grandfather of possibilities dot com. For you to take a deeper dive and learn more about Ron Klein. And there's a brief video clip on YouTube right there in the show notes. All the links are right in the show notes. Click on those. Copy and paste those. Check him out. Connect with him. And at the end, he's going to tell you a way to get in touch with him after the show. So, Ron, let's talk about real quick the why. 
I believe this is the most important aspect of what you do. So let's talk about the why. Why Absolutely. do you do what you do? Well, first of all, I call the why my mission. In other words, my mission is what I do and why I do it. Basically, it's my avocation. I create, I solve problems, and I develop things. And as I develop more and more and learn more every day, because I learn something new every day, I create more and more items. So that's my enhancement. So my mission is really to create and build and solve problems for people that provide a benefit. So I provide benefits for society. My vision is to, and and everybody can go along with this and answer their own questions too. My vision is to do the ultimate, to solve it in the best and most simplest way without complications that everyone can handle it correctly. You know, I say today, uh, a goldfish has an attention span of nine seconds and most people have an attention span of eight seconds. And if you can't get your message across in the first eight seconds, nobody's going to listen to the rest. So you've got mm-hmm. to make your message known in those first eight seconds. And then you're going to have, hey, could you tell us some more? Then you can go into details. The last thing mm-hmm. is my purpose. And you'll ask yourself, the purpose doesn't come that easy. You can pick Pretty much everybody can tell me what their mission is. They can tell me what their vision is, but they can't tell me right off the bat what's their purpose. And it took me quite a while starting my companies and growing my companies until I learned to listen to others and develop my purpose. And my purpose didn't necessarily have to have anything to do with my mission, but it has to do with life. And my purpose is never to be a burden. And what that means is I have to be a responsible person. I have to maintain my health. I have to be responsible to society. I never want to be a burden in any way. I have to be a citizen that really participates and provides quality time and benefits to society. Otherwise, If I don't have that purpose, I don't belong here. So that's the overall answer to my why. Love it. So so talk about the credit card ship. It's a fascinating story. And I heard it at Podcast, and there was like a video uh, that was kind of talking about it. And then you elaborated more. Tell us about those first beginnings about that credit card strip. Cause I think it's absolutely fascinating the way that your mind methodically worked through that problem and had the answer later on. Well, again, thinking simply, the directors of a very large department store came to me in 1966. It was actually a little before 66 and said, we have a problem. It takes too long to make a charge purchase. And that's what they called it then. They didn't call it credit card purchases. They said a charge purchase. And every month, the credit card companies would give the merchants a big, thick book of all the negative account numbers of those people that are having problems with their account. And then they also said the burden of proof, the burden of who should we really issue credit to is not on the right people. It ends up being on the credit card or on the merchant. And that's the wrong thing. So the issue is, and I looked at it and I say, okay, the given is it takes too long to make a charge purchase and the burden's on the wrong person. So I said, well, that's simple. Let's just take all those negative account numbers that the credit card gives every merchant every month and put it into some kind of memory system. Now, in 1966, the memory systems were big magnetic drums, but that's not important. Put it into these Big magnetic drums. Okay. And then what do we do? Then I said, let's give the the merchant a little keypad and he can key in the account number. And if the account number doesn't come up in that memory system, the person's good to go. So that solves one problem. It speeds things up a little bit, but the burden is still on the wrong person. It's still on the merchant. It should be on the credit card companies. 
And right around that time, I said, we've got to put some smarts in the little piece of plastic because it only had the account number on it and the person's name embossed on it. And right around that time, reel-to-reel tape recorders came out. And I know a lot of the young people in your audience don't remember that. It looks like two reels with quarter-inch tape, magnetic tape on it, and it would pass through a, a, a reed head, and you could put music on the tape, you could put voice on the tape, and if you kept the tape at a constant speed, it would sound normal. If you speed it up a little bit, mm-hmm. it would sound like Mickey Mouse. If you slow it down, it would sound like Dracula, but that was the principle. And I said, I've got a great idea. And I bet if oh, all the people in your audience were with me, they would have the same idea. I said, I know how a tape recorder works. Why don't I take a little piece of the tape, cut it off, record the account number on it, paste it on the back of the plastic credit card, build the little device that mimics a tape reader, and make you the motor. Swipe it through. So all it is is a tape recorder, a little device that sits on the merchant's desk, and you swipe this little card through it, so you're the motor, and there's a little piece of tape with the account number on it, and boom, that was the invention of the magnetic strip on the credit card. That's how simple it was. Now it, it was faster, and the burden was put on the credit card companies, not on the merchant. On the merchant, he was just the man who swiped it, or the person who swiped it. You guys were just the motor. That's mm-hmm. the solution. That's how simple. That's amazing. This changed the world. I had no idea at the time it was going to make major changes and change and affect billions of people, but it was a simple invention. Yeah. It provided a do you, benefit. Do you think that solved the problem? Oh, hundred percent. Oh, I, I absolutely agree. And you're always talking about simple. Make it simple. It's it's simple. Do you feel like people overthink the problem? Is that is that why some of the inventions don't get invented? Right. They don't look at what the purpose is, what the benefit is. They forget what I was originally saying. What's the given? What's the solution you're looking for? They start in the middle. They start in the journey. They're right in the journey, and they don't know where to go. They have no idea. They go into the think tank and say, I've got to invent something. What are you going to invent? You don't even know what the given is, what you have to work with, and you don't even know what the solution is that you're looking for. You're busy working on the hurdles in the middle of the journey, and that's what most mm. people do. That's, I, I think that's huge. That's a big, big takeaway. Wow. Right. So, so you've what, got to be smart, daring, and different. That's the answer. Yep. Have you uh, – have you heard of a guy named Christopher Lockhead? No, I haven't, Sean. The only reason I bring it up is because he has a book or he has a well a podcast called Follow Your Different. And he's always talking about, he's like, got to be different. Stop competing with each other. You got to be different. Got to be different. That's what's going to unlock the next big thing is you being different. Think about it different. Come from a different angle, different, different. He harps on being different and his book is about being different. And so I just figured that, um, that you well, you had heard about it. Well, I agree with him. He's thinking different, and you have to think in a mm-hmm. simplistic way as to don't mm-hmm. complicate it. Don't complicate it. Think about what it needs to provide a benefit. And if you can't come up with what it needs to provide the benefit, then you're not ready for it. That's the yeah. solution. Oh. Okay. Absolutely. And, and I did that, and, I, and it just simply went on too. And I did that with the MLS system for realtors, and I did that for voice response for the banking industry. I also built a system that uh, fed chickens faster and provided more nutrition for them. It just went on and on and on because I used that same principle. And then I made lots of mistakes along the way and benefit and learn by those mistakes. That's another story that when you're ready for it, I'll tell that. Oh, you know, there's so much learning in failure. I love failing. Not like a huge, like, you know, wreck a car failure, but I'm, I mean, you know, just, just fail. Like if I start a company or if I'm doing something and I fail, I'm like, well, that sucked. So then I look at it. I'm like, okay, what can I change to make it a success? This line that I followed failed. Let's 
let's try something else. Let's tweak this one thing or this one thing. And that's how I've built the businesses that I have because I epically failed. I just went out there and crashed and burned. was like, what, what exactly was good? What exactly failed? What made it fail? Let me tweak that one thing, tweak this other thing. Boom. And now it's uh, firing on all cylinders. That's what I love to do is, is kind of create something, let it fail, fix it, and then boom. And I want to fail hard and fast because I don't want to get a year well, down the road and, and have a false sense of, a false positive that I'm successful and then have it blow up in my face. That would suck. Well, you, you, you're right, Sean, and there's only plan A. There are no other plans, okay? There's <laughs> only plan A, and, and what you have to do is realize what the problem is. You know, most people don't realize that there's a word called or there's words called what if, and there's always a what if. You know, you have a plan, strategically lay something out. It should flow this way. But in between each function that flows in a certain way that you've planned, there is a what if. And when you come to what if, that's the worst case situation. How do you solve the what ifs? And that's what I did with, with my company. It was growing as I was building all these things and creating all these things. Company was growing quite rapidly. There was no uh, internet at that time. There was no emails and no software development. So my company grew quite rapidly with lots of employees because I needed engineers and draftsmen and manufacturing people. So I was up to like 125 people. I needed money, so I raised money through a private offering. That did well, and then I even needed more money. And I, I took the company public and learned all about registration and public offerings because I went to the library and read the Securities Act cover to cover and became an expert in it. Point is, the company was doing very well. It was very attractive. I was reaching retirement age. I was 34 years old, and a, a very major large insurance company came to me and said, we're interested in acquiring you. And I figured, oh, well, geez, 34, maybe it's time to retire and sell out. Well, that lasted three days. I, I sold out, and I figured I was going to do just relax. And after about three days, I decided I've got to go back to work. And that's when I said, I don't want my job to be labor intensified. I want some passive income. And I mapped out everything that I wanted ultimately. And I said, until I come up with that idea and how I do that, I'm going to go out and sell other people's products because I was pretty sharp in communications because my background was electronic engineering and mathematics. And I had some good experience working with customers. So I figured I would go out and market. That changed my life. Because the most important thing happened to me. One day I was calling on a very large firm that used telecommunication equipment. I was trying to sell him something. And on his desk, I saw a bid sheet from the Western Union Company. Western Union provided teletype equipment. And in those days, back in the 60s and early 70s, teletype is what they used for email. There was no such thing as email. They had these machines that would type and print and had paper tape punch and they would use them on telephone lines and that's how they would communicate. And I figured, wow, that's an interesting business. Everybody knows teletype. I can get involved with this. And what was on his desk was a bid sheet from Western Union. And he said, we no longer have a need for this. If you're interested, you can have the bid sheet. Go up there to Allentown, Pennsylvania. Every week they put all these teletypes up for sale that they refurbish. And maybe you can, you know, do something with those. I figured, wonderful. I rented a truck. I went to Allentown. And I said, I want a bid. They had that, that week 12,000 of the old, old teletypes for sale because they were going into the satellite business and they were divesting themselves. And I figured, wow, that's wonderful. Everybody knows what teletypes are. I could buy these parts sell them for 50 cents on the dollar and buy them for pennies. And I bid on 12,000 teletypes and I won all 12,000. You know why? Wow. It was one of the, it was one of the biggest mistakes I made in my life. I never asked where were they? Nobody else bid on them because 4,000 were in a warehouse close by 8,000 were all over the country. 
and you had to take possession of them in 30 days. Oh, I was no. in big trouble. I didn't win anything. I inherited liability because where was I? What was I going to do? I had to take possession of these teletypes that weighed hundreds and hundreds of pounds that were made back in the 40s and 50s. Most of them were used on battleships for communications. What was I going to do? Well, I hit that period called what if, and that's where I was. And I figured, okay, Ron, what do you do? If you've got this situation, you call the junk man. He's maybe the only person that can help you. I bought these things for a penny on the dollars. I have 4000 back in Allentown. I'll be happy with the 4000 I have to get rid of the 8000 Junk man came in and said, Mr. Klein, let's see what you have here. And he started examining, well, there's keyboards and printers, paper tape punches. He said, let's look in the bottom. He looked in the bottom of all these cabinets, and they were loaded with printed circuit cards. That's what they used in those days. These were printed circuit cards with transistors and resistors and components. And the printed circuit cards, the, the traces on the cards were gold. The reason they were gold no was way. because gold had great conductivity then. It was very cheap. It was only $35 an ounce. And they didn't want the huh. traces to rust on the battleships out at sea. And he said, wow. This gold is valuable. I said, what should we do? He said, if I take all these thousands of cards, submerge them in a cyanide bath, the cyanide eats the gold off the circuit cards, it rises to the top, we skim off the gold, we'll do an assay on it, and split the gold profit 50-50. I said, you got a deal. We were so fat in cash, let me tell you, it was a winner. So one of the biggest mistakes of my life, because I measured the what if, turned into a fruitful experience. But now I had 8,000 pieces of equipment that were pure junk because they had no electronics. They couldn't work. They were just keyboards, printers, paper tape punches. And I said, now what do I do? The junk man came back and said, let's find out what we can do with all of this equipment. He discovered that the cabinets were very rich in chromium. They were chrome and steel, but they had a lot of chromium hmm. in them. And he said, Toyota is now shipping a brand new model of their car. This was in 1972 through 72 and 75 over to this country. And they're having a rust problem with their car because they don't have enough chromium in their steel. I said, wonderful. Give them all the steel give them all the equipment for nothing, let them take it. I turned a negative, serious problem into a plus. Now I own huh. 4,000 teletypes. I was in business to refurbish them, okay? And I owned them for nothing and had all that cash from the gold. <laughs> and I was now, and this all came about from reading a bid sheet on a, a consumer customer's desk. But here's the best part of the story. I'm going to tell you the finish of it, and then I'll let you talk. Okay. Three months later, after I did this, I got a call from the New York Stock Exchange. And they said, we discovered that you bought all the teletypes, the old teletype equipment from Western Union. And there were 273 special teletypes in that inventory that we use at the New York Stock Exchange for inquiry stations. They're wall mounts, and they hang on the walls, and all the brokers use them on the trading floor. We need those machines. And I said, let me see if I have them. I had 273 in inventory in a mix amongst the 4,000. Mm -hmm. And they said, are you interested? I said, I'm interested. I'll give you a full payout, long-term lease. If you give me a maintenance contract to maintain those machines on the trading floor forever, and I'll start a maintenance company. What a wonderful story. I came <laughs> to the New York Stock Exchange awesome. every day. And while I was there, I just kept seeing more and more things to innovate and improve because the exchange was antiquated. It was They still worked on old pieces of paper and, and little slips of piece of paper that they used as Mark Sense cards. And this is the end of the story. 
while I was walking what? around on the exchange in 1983, I discovered that their equity market, because they traded stocks and bonds, the equity market mm-hmm. had been totally automated. They never automated the bond market. It was still an auction market on a bond trading floor. And I went there and I watched all these traders throwing their hands up and down, screaming at the top of their lungs, buying and selling corporate listed bonds. I went to the exchange and I said, I can automate that so easily. And they said, Ron, you'll never do it because they've been trading like this for 205 years and they're not going to change. I said, if I can build a little system to hook on your main line that would really enable them to trade in their offices upstairs, would you give me an exclusive license to be a a bond disseminator as an exclusive vendor Mm -hmm. of choice? And they said, sure, because it'll never happen. I built this little box with a video terminal. It worked perfect. I started calling all bond traders. There were 1,500 of them on Wall Street. I started calling them. If I wasn't buying or selling a bond in five seconds, they'd hang up on me. I figured, oh, my God, this guy was right. How am I going to sell this concept? So I befriended the best and the largest bond trading company on Wall Street, the manager of that company. And I said, I'm going to run a telephone line to your office from the New York Stock Exchange and put this system, this little filter box and video terminal on your desk free for 30 days. Will you try it? He said, sure. Why not, Ron? I have nothing to lose. He tried it. He had the information milliseconds before they had it on the bond trading floor. His phone rang off the hook, and they were saying, Joe, what are you doing? For the last two weeks, we haven't been able to trade a bond. He said, oh, you need one of those little bond climb boxes. My phone (laughs) rang off the hook. I had 1,500 bond traders calling me constantly. How can we get the system? And I figured, what an opportunity. This is 1983. It was fat times on Wall Street. And I said, you've got to join my buying club. Every trader has to give me $10,000 to join the club. And they said, wow, that's stiff. But you want to know something? It's worth it. We can make that back in two weeks. They joined the club, and they gave me $10,000 apiece. I was wow. in healthy condition. Then they said... <sighs> I've said to them, but now you have to buy this little filter box with a video terminal. They said, oh, no, we don't buy anything on Wall Street. We only rent equipment. I figured, "Uh uh-oh, the box cost me $100. The video terminal cost me $50. I said, how's $300 $300 a month? And they said, fantastic. It was in there for a quarter of a century providing transparency. That's the beginning of the story. Okay, and then I did it for New York Stock Exchange, American Stock Exchange, CBOE, Futures Exchange, Treasury Market, and that's the end. And what did I do? I paid attention, and I saw a bid sheet on a customer's desk, and he sent me to Western Union. Smart, daring, and different. Any questions? Uh, I'm just blown away. Like. (laughs) <laughs> like just the innovation, like the mindset, right? I I, I literally have. The, I wasn't the, the sharpest knife in the drawer. Very, I just did common sense things. Yeah. I, what I want to know, and I think is very relevant today with this online. Everybody wants to be the the digital nomad and the online coach and all this other stuff. You said that you told them. You pay me ten thousand dollars to join this club, and you get X amount of whatever. Why ten thousand dollars? I feel like somebody today is saying, "Oh, coach with me, or buy my service, or hire me as a speaker, or whatever." And then when they get to the price, they stumble and they fall, and they're like, "Uh, well, uh, ten thousand." Uh, and, and then I'm not well, sure that they're worth, it, or maybe they're not sure that that someone's going to pay it. I was talk about that. Here's what I came up with, Sean. I changed the entire posture of the corporate listed bond market. The New York Stock Exchange was in business to do two things, to maintain an orderly market and sell 
equity stock. Okay, they marketed the stock in a in a in a very organized way. Then they also listed on the exchange the debt of those companies that provided their equity. That was the corporate listed bonds. So if General Electric had their stock sold on the New York Stock Exchange, they also had their bond, their debt sold. They never automated the debt market. It was slow. It was mm-hmm. fine. All I said was you'll tr- increase the value and increase the market share of bonds if you increase the volume and the, and the speed. And that's what I did. And the marketplace went from $100 million a day to $20 billion a day over the next 10 years. Okay? Because it was now an automated system. So yeah. I, knew what that, I knew the benefit that it was going to provide. And I said to these brokers, you're in a whole new world now. It's going to trade a lot differently. And I figured that's a bargain at $10,000 to be part of this new trading system. And they were glad to pay it. And today they still thank me. That was pocket change. It was a lot of money then, but it's pocket change now. And now what did they do? And they rented equipment that I made a fortune on it because I I had 1,500 terminals out there with every bond trader, and I was collecting $300 a month. Jeez. All because I paid attention. Yep. You have to provide that, a benefit. What was the benefit I was providing? It wasn't a game. It wasn't just an idea. It wasn't just a newfangled invention. It was a benefit. 1,500 terminals you had yep. out there, and you collected $300 on each one. Yes. That's, that's almost a half for, a million dollars. For 20 years. <laughs> Oh my gosh, that is awesome! Man, okay, ask, I was like, "How did I retire at 34?" That's what I was asking. Like, how did this guy wait? He said he retired well, at 34. Like, how did well, that? Listen, I failed at retirement three times. I tried it at 34. Then yeah, after right. I came back, I started another company, and I, yeah. I worked that company until I was 61. And then mm-hmm. I figured. Then I moved to Florida, and I've been here in Florida for 25 years. And I thought I was going mm-hmm. to retire in Florida. Then I became a consultant, a mentor, and I'm busier now than I was ever before in my life. Oh and my I'm gosh. still working full time. And I love it. And I'm never going to stop. It's awesome. I love it. What, where did the MLS come in? Did you take the knowledge from that and just the, the automation and all that? Did you move it, that over? That was, and it, it was so simple. It was so simple. <laughs> the MLS system, I automated that in 1967. Because NARAB, the National Board of Realtors, were in uh, Chicago, and they didn't have sufficient information that if there was a property for sale in one place and uh, and some a need in another place, all I did was put all these listings together in a central computer, gave them a portable terminal in which they can go sit down in someone's house, take an acoustic coupler because touchstone phones were just coming out then. They could take a a telephone, call up the central computer in Chicago, put the phone into this little suitcase terminal, which was an acoustic coupler, set up the thumb wheel switches on the kind of property they wanted. Swimming pool, three bedrooms, two baths, close to schools, blah, blah, blah. They would set it up and then push a button. And I had touch tone phones beep through all the switches and send that down the line to the central computer central computer would digest it and match it up to whatever else was out there. So all I did was centralize multiple listing. And then I used teletype mm. machines to print the listings out. Simple. I, That's set, awesome. I solved the problem, turned it, solved the challenge, solved the problem, provided a benefit, and boom, that was it. Same thing with voice That's response amazing. for banking. Okay, when yeah. touchstone phones finally came out, we wanted to use the touchstone phone as a terminal to key in our account number to the bank so that the bank could come back and tell us what we had in the bank, what was in the account. And mm-hmm. I converted the mm-hmm. touchstones to text and the text to voice. And the voice, I synthesized the voice. How did you learn that? First. How, how, 
How would somebody learn uh, that? Well, I was an engineer. And if I if uh, I didn't know okay. everything, if I didn't have all the engineering smarts myself, I would have hired engineers. I would have hired the right sure. people. And all I did sure. with the first voice response system I had, we had big memory drums, big magnetic drums that would rotate in milliseconds mm-hmm. before they had, you know, computers. And on these drums, what I did was I took a reed head and put like a hundred tracks on the drum and each track Mm -hmm. had a different syllable and then I would take the text message that would be the information in your account and I would take each word and size it up with the right syllable on the drum and feed that back to your telephone so remember when we first had voice response it would sound almost like Mm -hmm. a robot it would say this is voice response okay then I figured I've got to make this better and I started synthesizing the syllables, so it came out a lot simpler. But I just mm. solved problems. I was just solving problems, providing a benefit, and simplifying it. Be smart, and you're, daring, and different. And, and that's your mindset is is to like if you're. I'm I'm really curious how Ron looks at a problem, and how there he comes no up problems. with a solution. There, no, there are no problems. Remember. There is no such thing as a problem. I want every one of your listeners to open up the dictionary, look up the word problem, tear that page out, then get a highlighter and go look up the word challenge and highlight it. Because problems are frustrations. We turn problems into challenges and find the gift behind the challenge. Oh, find that I love that. Okay. That's the answer. Oh, my God. Hey, that's amazing. I'm looking at our, at our time limit here. It says I already have three minutes left. Anybody yeah. want to ask me a hard question? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I mean, this is more of a guideline, really. The the live stream will cut off in uh, in, in two and a half minutes, but uh, but the show goes on. Uh, what I... So, so I'm just trying to – I was trying to focus in on that and, and really hone in on how you approached that because I get – oh, I definitely get the simple. Make it simple. Make it different. I totally get that. And I love where you said that there's no problems. It's just challenges. And I love that. It's a great way to look at it. I feel like I a lot clients. of people literally – Yeah, well, I was going to say I have clients that come to me constantly with challenges, and they don't know how to handle it. And what you have to do is yeah. identify what the challenge is and say, okay. what is the what do we need to do to fix it? It's almost like what they learned in word problems in, in grade school. Remember, we used to get mm-hmm. all these word problems with all mm-hmm. the superfluous information that was useless. And the way you would solve the word problem is to dig out what was the given, what's the, you know, what's the information that has value, and then what was yep. the, the answer that they're looking for. And throw everything else out. That's just the the minutia, yep. and that's the way you. I was really good at word problems. You're like train well, A leaves this place at, at what challenge. time? Train B. Yeah, I, I was and, good at that stuff because all it is is a formula. At that point, it's yeah, all it is you is a formula. It's and you didn't a, care what color it's the train was. Height, width, weight. Right. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, you didn't care what the name was. The color. It was either a height with weight. It was a velocity. It was a speed. It, it was some kind of a prop. Like, but it gave you the variables and the you know whatever. Uh, you know, you. I mean, you had all the information. You just got to work a formula. So for See, me, now, the work problems were easy. Like, what are we going to push in the formulas? That's that's really all you do. Now you can go tell everybody that you met Ron and how simple a guy he is. I'm a simpleton. Oh my God, it's absolutely <laughs> incredible because. <laughs> I'm looking, I'm like, how, literally, how would you know this? And then because you have an engineering background, I'm like, okay, I got the, I, I told, the phones make sense. The suitcase makes sense. You know, for those today that are getting into entrepreneurship, I, I, that, I literally feel like entrepreneurship is overinflated in the fact that so many people want to be entrepreneurs and they say they're offering value, but are they really? And what I see a lot of after after the the what, 2020, I've been building this since 2004. My mom, my uncle, my sisters are all entrepreneurs. They've all built businesses, all successful. My aunt. And the one thing I know for sure, for certain, 
is that you must provide value. That's what you said. You must provide a benefit, right? And then people want to get all fancy with it now. You have know, online and click funnels and this, that. And what do you say to all that? Nine seconds for a goldfish, eight seconds for most of the public. If you can't get your mm. message across in eight seconds, you lost them. Anybody and how listen, does one do that? How do you get a message across in eight seconds? How would Ron get a message across? Identify the problem. First of all, all uh-huh. I say, here's what I live by. I refuse to have a battle of wits with an unarmed person. Does that make sense? <laughs> I get it. I get it. Okay. Yeah, I get it. So I have yeah. to educate someone, put them on my wavelength and say, we can agree to disagree, but here's my advice. I'm not going to give you my opinion. Opinions that come from people who have never done things before. Advice comes from qualified people who know what they're talking about. So here's my message. Here's the, here's the way my viewpoint I want to hear your viewpoint. Here's why I think this way. What do you think? In eight seconds, we've established communications. If I just start yeah. battling, I lost them. They don't hear all they hear is yep. blah 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 blah. I remember, refuse to have a battle of wits with an unarmed person. I love it. All your listeners out there, yep. remember that. <laughs> You give me a lot to think about. Okay. You give me a lot to think about. Wow. Uh, what I want to do is I want – so I want to give somebody a takeaway. So is this the takeaway? Or if nobody listens, they just – they're driving. They're not really paying attention. They've kind of missed the episode. Really, what is the takeaway? If you had to give somebody a message, what is the one takeaway that you want them to know and understand? Look at everything in a very simplistic way. Make sure that the challenge that you're attempting to solve, whether it be your personal life, your married life, your finances, whatever it is, that you know what the what if is, and it provides a benefit. The result will provide a benefit. So you have to be smart, daring, and different. And the daring is extremely important. If you painted it the wrong color, what are you going to do? Mm-hmm. Sean, paint it over. Paint it, to death. Paint it over. <laughs> and the other thing paint is, it over. there's only plan A. You always hear stories yeah. about, oh, well, there's plan B and plan C. No, there isn't. There's only plan A. Fix it. Yep. What I like to do is reverse engineer things. I'm a huge reverse engineer person. If I know that I have to sell a certain amount of money, and, you know, a certain amount of – if I'm trying to earn a certain amount of dollars, I know I need to sell these many per price point, whatever. If I want to get booked on X amount of stages to get booked to speak, which is my goal, uh, I speak about 20, 25 times a year. I'm guest on like 50, 60 podcasts a year. If I know that I need to reach this goal, what are my actions that need to lead up to this? So I start with the goal, and then I just reverse engineer backwards. And okay. so I've done that like my whole entrepreneur career and, and all four businesses that I built. One of them uh, got all the way to the over 650K. It was like – it was amazing. It was amazing a couple of years. And it, all I did was reverse engineer the issue, and I always start with like what's the main – what are we trying to accomplish and how do we work backwards to get to where we are right now? And that to me revealed the pathway that I needed to follow and the blueprint that I needed to follow. So I don't stray left or right. I could just stay on that same path. That's what I've always used. The takeaway is make sure that you're always in a listening mode and not just in a hearing mode. Everybody Mm -hmm. hears very few people listen. It works. That's big. That's big. Ron, you are I have to apologize. Star. Listen, I have to thank you. I have yeah. to apologize for going over time. I'm really sorry. You're good. No, you're good. I'm sorry. No, the show continues. It's a forty five minute live stream, but you know, we're gonna continue on. <laughs> It's okay. good. Uh, I, just, I I wanna thank you for your time. I wanna honor your time. You are absolute brilliant man thank and you're you. and you have an absolute brilliant mind. I'm listening. And and I'm just I'm blown away. 
I don't I don't know. I don't know what I was expecting. Maybe I was expecting a magic pill or a secret sauce or something, but you're like, nope. No, simple, daring, no. different. Just be those three things and you're good. <laughs> I was like, that's a it. Simple old guy. <laughs> a simple old guy. You know what? Maybe right. people listen to me now. I love I'm it. Old. <laughs> no, I love it. I absolutely love it because I mean, I I always try to follow my different. I've always tried to be different. Like like this show, Life Transformation Radio, isn't a podcast. It's a live online radio show, and it's repurposed into a podcast. So yeah, I got a podcast, but it's a live online show where people can actually call in and talk to the guests. There's no other radio shows doing that. That's repurposing into a podcast. No. They will be soon. I'm sure there are now. But when I started in 2017, there wasn't. It'll be great to see if you get any feedback on what we delivered today. Because, so I you know, have I a couple of messages. Yeah. Yeah, I have a couple of messages. So Douglas Vermeeren said that okay. you were an absolute brilliant man and you have inspired him to achieve everything that he's achieved. Thank you. And he wanted me to tell you that, that he looks up to you and he's inspired by you. Thank you. Thank you. That's and then really, James Van Pruen. Yeah. yeah. What were you saying? I was going to say that really makes me feel good. It makes me feel like I have a purpose. Really. Mm-hmm. And James Van Pruen says that he has much to learn and is grateful for everything that you've contributed. Well, I appreciate it. And you know, if people would just like to spend a few minutes with me on the phone and they have mm-hmm. a question or they they would just like to ask or they're looking for an answer to something, I feel free just to give you my cell phone and let them give me a call. Sure. I have no problem with that. Sure. So if anybody yep. has a What's pencil and paper in hand, here it comes, 941-374-5735. And you can text me on the same number. Outstanding. Ron, I want to thank you so much for spending time with me and my audience today. It has absolutely been phenomenal. I'm headed back to PodFest March 6th, 7th, and 8th. I'm doing a breakout speaker uh, session about the little-known hacks to grow a podcast audience that nobody's using. These hacks, hardly anybody's using. So if if you're in the area – you know, hopefully I see you. If not, Ron, it has absolutely been an amazing experience uh, spending the time with you. I'm extremely grateful. If there's anything that I can ever do to bring value to you or support you in any way, please let me know. I'd love to do that for you. Thank you so much. And please say hello to Chris at PopFest for me. Oh, I definitely will. Definitely will. Okay. Life Transformation Radio, an amazing guest, literally impacting the world impacting the world around him. If anything has resonated with our conversation today between myself and Ron Klein, please connect with him. Check out Envision, Eli, E-L-I, dot com, and go to the grandfather of com. Click on the links, copy and paste them, do what you got to do, connect with him. He gave you a cell phone number, shoot him a text, ask the man a question. He is absolutely brilliant in his mind being simple, daring, and different. And with that, I close the show by saying, live your brand. Find opportunities every day to live out the core values that you hold deep in your heart. And I call this living your brand. So until the next episode, live a great life.